Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 80. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, the salute. Good to see Hello, you. Hello, my, my friend. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm in the office, um, not in New York City, um, where uh, the NYSC studio is, but I'm in, in Palo Alto in, in our super studio location here, our super node, as we call it. And uh, great to be back. Uh, with I'm team. in the mini node. <laughs> it's a super note if you're there yeah. um <laughs> yeah, that's you too yeah, just kind. getting back and just gearing up for a what's going to be a really really strong fall window for us as you know we got the big events coming up um, um we had uh trinity over at nysc was at money 2020 i checked out that coverage um and we got uh, cloud native uh conf con and kubecon coming up in, uh, in salt lake city we got reinvent right around the corner. We got supercomputing. Yeah, you know, been on. I just been on the phone here in Silicon Valley all week talking to entrepreneurs and developers and founders. Had a chance to chat with Broadcom yesterday. IBM again today. Yeah, you know, just the you know, there's a lot of engagement around the horn around um, what's going on right now. Obviously, AI is booming, continues to boom. We're starting to see the big players, uh, you know, with the earnings come out this week. Um, massive numbers. We're going to dig into that very deeply on this episode. So we're going to spend a bulk of our time breaking down, you know, the big companies that we cover, Meta, Microsoft, AWS, Apple, Intel, mainly because they had some glowing results from the CEO, um, Pat Gelsinger, and you have an opinion on that. I want to dig into that. You just posted, uh, recorded your breaking analysis for tomorrow, um, which I want to dig into because... And we're going to have slides. So if you're on YouTube, you can see the slides. If you're on Spotify, you're going to hear the, the narration. Um, some interesting little niche stories. Obviously, cloud security. You see in uh, Honey Pots are working. Amazon put out a story. Their cybersecurity sleuths are emerging from the shadows. Bloomberg had a great story on that. And, um, and there was an interesting piece I want to bring up because Jeff Bezos wrote, wrote an op-ed piece on Washington Post mm -hmm. about their endorsement or lack thereof for the president of the United States and massive cancellations, you know, 20,000 plus cancellations <laughs> of their 2.5 people million are subscribers. pissed. People are pissed. I'm not pissed. Are you pissed? Top reporters. <laughs> no, I mean, I think Bezos is just being Bezos, right? He's just saying, Hey, you know, the flywheel. I remember when Amazon was um, in, the, in, the, in the dot com bubble, he was getting hammered over um, his approach to the stock price versus dividends and, the losses, everyone was going nuts at the time. If you remember, Amazon was like losing money and it's never going to be profitable. Um, and of course, they had their earnings. Amazon Web Services continues to power the profits. But you know, Jeff Bezos and the entire Amazon team across all their businesses built their entire back on iterating, right? So um, his message, um, timing was terrible, but it was the classic Jeff Bezos, Amazon, Amazonian way of, you know, it, listen to the customer and work backwards. Now, the people are freaking out because their customers are the readers and the writers and the people who work there, they're all leaving too. So top reporters are leaving and people going crazy. And, you know, I think on one hand, Dave, it's like, you know, timing was terrible. Message was great, but we'll dig into that. And again, um, the money keeps pouring in. Um, startups are getting funded again, still funding. Um, core weaves. By the way, by the way, uh, the the editor-in-chief, I think she's the editor-in-chief of The Economist, was on TV, and they do endorsements. She's like, oh, we do endorsements. You, you know you know who they endorsed. It was yeah. no surprise, but, um, which is fine. Nothing against that. But um, she was talking about how they have, they're not afraid to endorse. You know? <laughs> I mean, who's not afraid to endorse? I know I don't really get way into politics. We don't on the podcast, but you know, it does hit home with Jeff Bezos being a media um, power player. Um, and we know a lot about him and the company culture. So, but also we are in media and Dude. what's interesting about the Jeff Bezos thing is that that article, if you read it, it's at the Washington post, it's, it's available for free and usually have a paywall, but you know, he talks about media and he actually slam dunks podcasts, which is we're podcast style. So he calls it, you know, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, unresearched podcasts, essentially calling them, you know, irrelevant. And I remember when blogging was hot, back on 20 years ago, um, it was all the mainstream media saying that they weren't relevant. I think this election um, is a, is an awakening. Uh, mainstream media just not hitting the notes to the, to this next generation. 
who are listening to podcasts and they're not they're not watching TV because they know they're biased. So he basically calls that out. Well, in his piece. The other Huge. thing, the other thing I'll I'll add, and you will remember this well because you were in the middle of it, is Trump basically killed Amazon's win with Jet uh, Jedi. Remember? Yeah. I mean, they yeah. had that deal done. And Trump was like, oh, I don't like Bezos, so we're going to look into this. <laughs> That's my take on it. Yeah. And so I don't blame Bezos for like, hey, Meanwhile, I don't the really week before be Saffir Kath was at the White House, Oracle and others. And so, look, I mean, Trump is just not, he's just at the top. He's just at the head, right? So, you know, to me, I think Bezos wouldn't endorse Trump. So people think he's on Trump's side. And there was a report that came out that Andy Jassy talked to Trump and Trump actually demanded that they write a check. Um, and then, you know, all this media and misinformation, the division between cable TV and mainstream media um, is clearly broken. And I think this next generation, my opinion is, is that they're getting their sources from Joe Rogan and other outlets. And I think Joe Rogan had a huge coup. He had three hours of Trump. He had J.D. Vance on and Kamala will not come on. And so there's almost a nose snubbing at the um podcast even bezos talks about podcasting in here it's like hey you know um the unresearched podcasts of course our podcast is heavily researched you're going to drop some research dimes here. definitely so, sure yeah, Let's so, say so the word I, 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 i'm I ready to go to that so, like, wait a minute jeff <laughs> you obviously don't listen to the cube pod so jeff bezos if you're listening you should be listening if anyone's listening that knows jeff bezos should tell him he should listen to the cube pod because you know we get it right and we don't we don't hold any we don't pull any punches uh, but but I just found it very interesting that he's bringing that tech flywheel concept to media. And the message isn't wrong. I mean, he's not wrong at all. Mainstream media uh, is broken. And uh, Americans don't trust the news. Okay? They don't trust the news. He, he called out the poll from Gallup that said that people generally in the public think less of the media than they do of Congress. I mean, that's yep. bad. And so... And that's why the rise of this new creator culture is booming, Dave, because, you know, people are are in these tribal media circles and they're directly one click away. And this idea that media is the uh, the um, checking power and working on behalf of users is kind of old. And I think you know, and I've always said this and I don't I don't shy from it. my opinion. I, I shout it from the mountaintops. We're not traditional journalists, but we provide data and we report content and you know, john markoff used to have a saying he's the famous writer of the new york times he used to have a saying i hate the word journalism i like we're reporters and you're seeing a new reporting paradigm where the data is being reported now bezos does call out misinformation i think that is totally mm -hmm. legit and i think we're going to see a generational shift where these creators like us are going to be reputable some won't and they'll be called out and they'll ultimately be filtered probably by ai tools so you know, newspapers, TV on cable, print, journalism has to adapt. And the game is still the same. Seek the truth and get the data out there and let people consume it and be trusted. And reputation is everything. So, you know, you're going to see a lot of trust networks building. You're going to see collective intelligence become a data opportunity for media companies. And any media company that's not building an AI engine is, is going to be out of business because AI will be the force that will break through this logjam of, of mistrust, um, accuracy, who's credible, who's not, who's independent, who's being paid, who's not researched, who's a hot take. I mean, I saw analysts on TV yesterday throwing around numbers that was so wrong on the earnings. It was like, what planet are they living on? It looked like, you know, someone just coming off, you know, Skid Row talking about, you know, Apple and Amazon, like, like, like they just made it up. So, well, what was the, what were the, what, what were the comments? Let's talk about that. Well, just, you know, you get people on TV, like Apple's, I wouldn't bet on them. They got out the long play and Amazon's numbers should be in the 25% growth, 25%, they were 11% on a base. That's so big. It's just that, you know, they're just not informed. Right. And so there is some truth to the fact that, you know, there's a hot take market out there of analysts and journalists who are trying their best to get hot takes but they're just not deep enough on the expertise. So they don't have the deep dive knowledge like, like we do, for instance, like when we look at Amazon and we actually cover them for years, 
you get this is where the market's shifting. People are digging into content with people they trust because they know they've done the work over time, just like why the Washington Post and New York Times had that reputation because they knew that they could trust them, trust them. And so I think, you know, trust and reputation is really the key currency, original content, research. And if you're going to do a deep dive, I'm a huge fan of Pat McAfee, right? I love football. He's an amazing commentator. He does a podcast every day, goes deep. He goes deep and then it sits in the, the, the big chair on game day for ESPN. So that's the rise of the digital culture where you're going to see the Pat McAfee effect where, you know, someone who actually knows what they're talking about may look different, builds an audience and then brings that on to bigger outlets. So I think that's a rise of the quality, high quality talent is going to rise to the top. And I think we'll see a whole new set of brands emerge and um, the, the people who have to do it have to adjust the tactics. So can I lay some data on you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, um, guys, bring up the screen. And so to your point about um, Amazon, one analyst saying, what was it? That they should be growing 25%. at 25%. Okay, so this is, you can see the the quarterly data that we have here. Just as this is just the big four. We have other data, but this is just AWS, Azure, GCP, and Alibaba, which Charles Fitz says isn't a hyperscaler, but we put him in there. So you can see Q3 2024 here, AWS grew at 19.1%, Azure, and this is constant, this is attempt to be constant currency. I can't always get constant currency, but this is our best estimates. 19.1% for AWS, 34% for Azure, 36% for GCP, that's our estimate. They reported slightly lower than that uh, for overall cloud. And I'll explain. And then Alibaba's preliminary. So the big four total growing at 24% in the quarter. Okay. So the total market's growing at 24%. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things here. AWS is the only company that actually reports absolute dollar value of its IS and pass, because that's what they do, IS and pass. Now, they don't strip out some of the extraneous stuff. We have to do that. But that's pretty close to the total. Very de minimis non IS and pass figures, which last quarter you can see down below um, was 27.463 billion. Okay. Azure reports growth rates and they just played a little game that I can talk about where they lowered, they took out some legacy businesses, which in effect raised the growth rates. So um, Azure Microsoft lowered its number. It didn't talk about lowering its market share, but did talk about raising its its number or its growth rate. GCP growing nicely, but they don't also don't report their absolute IS and PaaS number. They don't report GCP. They just report the growth of total cloud. They don't even report GCP. Sometimes they make comments on it. The point, John, is if so, the market is is growing at twenty five percent overall 24%. So look at the numbers for the year. Okay. So this is, if you carry that through those quarterly numbers, carry it through the year, Amazon last year did $91 billion. Okay. So if Amazon were to grow, so Amazon growing at roughly 18, 19%, if AWS were to grow its $90 billion base, $91 billion base by 20, let's call it 25%. It would grow in 2024 by more than the entire value of GCP in 2024. Okay, so to your point, yeah. it's just, that's just a ridiculous statement. So if you look at the revenue shares and the reason we put revised on here is because the leaked court documents back a, a year ago last summer showed that Azure wasn't nearly as large as people thought. It was like 34 billion. And so we did the work to actually revise those numbers. So you can see here down below, AWS still has in 2024 of the big four, half over half the market. And so this is something that, thanks guys for, for the share. Um, this is something that I think people don't really understand well. Uh, and I think it's just a funny statement that AWS should be growing in the mid twenties. I mean, that's, they're huge. Can you imagine growing 25% on top of a hundred billion essentially? That's like I said, skid row analysts don't really make it in the long game, but 
to your point, what people don't understand about these market share growth is that the base numbers are, are important. That's what you're pointing out. The other thing about Amazon, and I learned this from my conversation with Andy Jassy over the years and recently, um, is that the way they do their spend with these marketplaces, people are pre-buying. So in some quarters, you know, um, Google's got a growing marketplace. It's one of their fastest growing services. Um, Azure saying they're getting a lot of AI growth, and that's mainly coming from the open AI piece. But their, uh, their numbers also don't reflect true growth because they're growing even higher numbers because the spend is coming in. So if I drop my spend and they, and they also discount that spend. So if I, and then they use the marketplace to draw services across in other quarters. So this game is always moving goalposts a little bit. So they have to sandbag it a little bit on the earnings. And that's where I think it gets interesting. And I think when the financial analysts have to squint through the numbers, they're always going to be kind of throwing a dart at the board. And this is where I think, you know, you got to look at other subjective factors like product portfolio growth um, and other factors that come into the momentum. Uh, Andy Jassy said their AI service is growing faster than um, their other business, their core business was back when it was growing. So, you know, to him, that's a, that's an interesting statement because what he's basically saying is, is that um, their triple digit year on year growth is in multi in its multi-billion dollar AI run rate. So their AI revenue, okay. Their AI business is scaling faster than AWS did at the same stage. Okay. The oh, interesting. For, the demand for AI capabilities is off the charts. So, you know, they're all showing, but even meta, okay. They're, they're, they're showing over a half a billion monthly actives users for meta AI and AI driven recommendations. And that's boosting engagement. Um, they trained 100,000 plus H100 cluster systems. So, you know, you're talking about the CapEx. I know you have a slide on this. Um, if you pull it up, you'll see yeah, bring that up, guys. numbers. Yeah, there it is right there. So look at this is from uh, Fitzy over there at Platformomics. Great blog to read. He's always got some great data. Uh, and he's, and he's, got, he's got fun, cheeky commentary, as they say. Um, but he's really good up at, about the CapEx tracking. And if you look at that, Meta is still in there. And remember, we said on this podcast um, many, many pods ago, many episodes ago, Meta is the dark horse. They could be the next AWS. Amazon is clearly not going to let anyone get in the game. But if you look at the last quarter's uh, impact on earnings, I mean, um, CapEx spend, they're all in the 10 plus billion dollars. Okay. You're talking about massive CapEx in increases. Amazon expects in 2024 to spend 75 billion plus um, yeah, in, in infrastructure investments, okay, to the growth. That's Amazon, that's just Amazon. We're talking about know, a couple of hundred billion in, I mean, that's, in, in, that's over the next- numbers, these are over like numbers. Over like 12 to 18 months, you're talking like a couple hundred billion, which is, and even when you throw in like some of the LLM vendor raises, it's yeah. and it's so, unbelievable. So, so when you look at companies like NVIDIA and people say, is NVIDIA reached their peak? Not at this spend, but at some point, when does it stop, right? So that's going to be the question we're all going to be looking at. When does the music Thanks, stop, Dave? You know, yep. this is going to be, and then by the way, don't count out AMD. You know, they announced too, but, but can, can I just go back to something about how companies like play with numbers? So yeah, yeah. Thanks guys. Bring this up. So I, it's very nuanced, but when those court documents leaked as part of the Activision um, trial. You mean Microsoft's numbers? Yes. Um, we had to go back and revise and map to that 34 billion. You know? and, and you have to reconcile you know, uh, quarters, fiscal quarters, the calendar quarters. And anyway, we did the work. Then what Microsoft did is they said a couple months ago, they said, hey, okay, we're going to change the way in which you report. We're going to take out. Uh, 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 enterprise mobility and security end user licenses. Now those were declining or at least legacy, not fast growing business. We're going to take those out and we're going to re, re we're going to now re, re report, re report or recast our Azure growth. So here's the old growth rates. Here's the new growth rates and they're higher and everybody got excited. Wow. Azure's growing faster than everybody thought. And all they did was they, they lowered the base 
And then what they did is they also at the same time increased the percent contribution of AI. And you can see that here. So this is fun with numbers. What does this all mean? So Amy Hood in the last call said, Azure growth included roughly 12 points from our AI services. Similar to last quarter, demand continues to be higher than our available capacity. So you can see in Q3 2024, it says E. It's actually no longer an E. I should take that E out, but 12%. That was my previous forecast. I didn't have to change it. I was right on. But so these were up from like high single digits in the previous um, uh, reporting. So all they did, what they did, rather, maybe not all, but what they did is they lowered the baseline of Azure, the absolute number, which automatically increased the growth rates and automatically increased the percent contribution from AI. Now, here's where this fun with numbers comes in. What does that even mean that Azure growth included roughly 12 points from AI services? So look what we did. We took our Azure revenue estimates and we took the Azure year-to-year -year growth. In other words, the absolute dollars from year to year. So for instance, we take, you know, Q4 23, we subtracted from Q4 22, we got 3 billion. Okay. Now there's two ways to calculate the 12% or at the time, 9%. See, number one, we could took the, we took the previous year's um, absolute number for Azure and multiplied it by the AI contribution percentage. That's one way you could say that's included roughly 12 points. We're going to, we grew 12 points off of that baseline, or you could take the current year for Azure, subtract the previous year, and then apply the 12 points to that, which is it? I don't know, but look at the difference. Look at line one, go to Q3, 2024. We're talking about the difference between 1.487 billion in AI contribution versus half a billion. And then they don't explain like how they calculate it. And I've got to dig through, you know, the 10 Qs and 10 Ks to see if they actually give us the calculation. I yeah. doubt they will because they at least leave it up to, to chance. And, you know, it just hypes things up. And so all companies, thanks guys, all companies do this, yeah. right? AWS is pretty good, but we've seen over the years how, whether it's IBM, Oracle, AWS, you know, hides the ball and some stuff too, you know, they all do it for their advantage, uh, but that's what research and, and analysts have to do, yeah, but that just gives you an example, John, of, of what a difference the numbers can make. Well, that highlights Dave, the whole trust thing that Bezos was kind of bringing up and also hat, hat tip to your, you and the cube research team. And we're all working hard. And I think we're now up to 13 analysts. And, and again, we pride ourselves on supporting our podcast and all the content we do with research, but this is what it takes. This is what it takes to be successful. And, you know, in this era where, the significant investments of these billions of dollars matter. The proof has to be in the pudding. That's revenue. So when you look at um, the earnings, okay, Microsoft, Meta, AWS, Apple, they're all going to have questions. What's the business model? So AI is changing multiple things at the same time. It's top-down management philosophy of the business model and the bottoms-up adoption of the tools and technology platforms that are being kind of restructured in real time. So you have this power dynamic between top down and bottoms up, and it's a potentially could be a good power dynamic or a negative power dynamic, depending on how you look at it. But at the end of the day, the cash flow has to support one, the CapEx build out, and two, the additional services revenue and um, uh, subscription revenue that comes from it. And then complicate that with the fact that these companies are starting to move from Trek classic SaaS ecosystems on cloud to connected ecosystems. And something that we've been reporting, I think we're the only outlet that's been reporting this idea of a connected ecosystem. And Dave, I just want to get your thoughts on this because you know, when you move from when you move from old to the SaaS, but the last generation, it was, you know, uh, either annual license or platform fees to um, subscriptions, okay, so right? Subscriptions was the big thing. Now usage becomes big. So you're starting to see the, the formation of these GPU clouds. You're starting to see um, beyond the API where you have gen AI engineered into the, each other's platforms. So whether you're a hyperscaler like Amazon Web Services or Azure, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud, the, the best clouds are engineering solutions for integrating into their ecosystem partners because they have to exchange data not just 
push data to another API, Actual have state and data exchange in real time. So that's why the CapEx build out so high because they require new technologies to do that. That's why NVIDIA is kicking ass because they have it. And so, you know, you have this connected ecosystem and that's going to change the applications uh, big time because that's going to make them have to be smarter and more intelligent. And that's where the game is. So that means a company like Apple, which doesn't have a strong AI piece, has to leverage their advantage, which is their devices, which is the uh, product revenue. Obviously, iPhones and were up big, um, but, you know, their results in services a little bit, you know, not as strong as they could be, right? But they're still booming, okay? Their product revenue, um, those numbers were good. Service revenue was good. They got a cash dividend. Don't count Apple out. Oh my they God, don't even no. Know CapEx chart. So, you know, you got to look at, you got to look at the, the overall operating cash flow. And I think Apple is not going to go away because even though the analysts are saying, oh, Apple's, you know, not, not positioned, you got to look at their business model. The phones are up, which means services will be kicking in. And then they have nearly $27 billion in operating cash flow. Okay returning about 29 billion to shareholders. Their active device base, phones and devices, all time high across all the regions and all products. So that's that's from the CFO. So, you know, don't, Apple is not going anywhere. Anyone who says they are is out of their mind. Um, the rich get richer in this cycle. Says that. Uh, uh, what I love about Apple, I mean, iPhone did better than people thought. You know, the stock was down 1%, 1.3% today. Um, and it was down on guidance. Uh, and I think, I mean, this is the way these things go, right? If if they don't, if they're whisper numbers and they don't beat, or they don't beat those whisper numbers, uh, or if the guidance is a little bit conservative, then, you know, the stock goes down. That That's fine. But what I really like about Apple, I mean, they did a 95 or a 90, yeah, $95 billion quarter revenue quarter, and they grew 6%, the $95 billion company per quarter, growing 6%, their services businesses, hundreds of billions of dollars, the gross margins going up. So Apple has about a 47% gross margin on, on iPhones, basically, <laughs> and computers. I mean, Dell's gross margins are what, like low 20s, you know, on, on devices. Um, and, and so, and they're headed up into the fifties, Apple, the next, next, the second half of this decade, they're going to approach 50% gross margin. And so they now have this services base, which is a hundreds of billions of dollars in services that they're just going to keep exploiting. And I know the criticism on Apple is just like, okay, where's the innovation. And so, you know, we want to see more there, but, but the, what a great business and, and the cash flow is just bolt, enormous. When they, bolt, when, they when they bolt on AI, I mean, we got their phone sales. Okay are good right i mean that's not a problem they just the, the demand for the phone is underappreciated as users with older phones are going to upgrade okay they have the intelligent ai everyone talks about it in the their intelligence product which is simply i mean okay not great vision pros a dog right so headset struggles i mean i think what meta's doing with the ray-bans is phenomenal but, you know, Apple will catch up there, but that's not a big needle mover for them. I mean, you look at their phone, you look at their marketplace, and you look at their service services. Solid as a rock, okay? So, again, the only thing, wild cards there is they had a ruling against them in Europe. Europe had to pay um, close to 10 plus billion dollars out to, to Europe. China sales are under threat. Obviously, we have the China regional, regional, um, the, uh, competition. Um, uh, this Apple China is interesting to watch. So between the tax ruling, uh, in Europe and China, okay, maybe, but they're just so strong. I mean, they're not okay. going to go anywhere. So I want to blow your mind. Okay. We all know how expensive these models are, right? These foundation models mm -hmm. to build. And, and it's just like, these guys are bashing each other's heads. It's like hundreds of millions and you know potentially more you know billions of dollars going into this thing. Guys, share the share the latest chart here. At the same time, so it's super expensive to to build these things. The blue line is GPT three, 
pricing. And the, the, the white line is GPT-4. So what this is a log scale. So what this shows you is that in three years, the GPT-3 GPT model pricing has dropped like four orders of magnitude in three years. And in, and in, and in two years, in 24 months time, the GPT-4 is on track to drop two orders of magnitude. So the costs are going through the roof and the prices are dropping through the floor. And then, oh, by the way, look at the notation at the top. This is from A16Z. Llama 3 offers the best price performance of any model. Right? Zuck says by the end of the year, we're going to have the best price performance. And so there's this race to the bottom. La, uh, Zuck's giving this stuff away. Elon's getting into it. And they're going to, Zuck and Elon are going to spend as much as, OpenAI has to spend, thanks guys, which is like they've raised like $20 billion. And so Apple's just sitting back and saying, go for it, guys. We're going we're gonna to let you bash your brains in and then we're going to apply all this innovation to our you know, half a billion dollar install base. It's, and by the way, that's open source too, by the way. So the developers are getting massive traction on that. So again, like we've been saying on the Cube Pod, as the infrastructure gets you know, settled, um, the developer community picks up, it's open source, therefore it's going to be stronger. That's when the app tsunami hits, there's going to be a huge renaissance and rebuilding of applications in this connected ecosystem. And, you know, the cloud players, the hyperscale is going to win big. I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, that's going to be huge. Um, so you got yeah. Apple, you got Meta. Now, Intel had their earnings, Dave. So, I mean, Intel... Uh, is is an interesting company you've been following uh, deeply. Um, well, Intel was up today, you know, substantially. Uh, I think it was up almost eight percent today. So, guys, share the slide. Here's the highlights. So that so that everybody's excited about Intel <laughs> and 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 revenue was came in better than expected, but it was down. See this this on the left hand. Uh, block here down six percent so their business is shrinking um but it's higher than the outlook gross margins got tanked because they had all these you know one-time charges you know but their gross margins are or you know on a non-gap basis were eight, i think 18 yeah, 18 percent here this quarter so you kind of can ignore that but but it's still way way down from their their height of mid 60s and then eps you know, negative 46 cents. So they're losing money, but look at the fine print. Okay. This is what I mean by companies. They bury this stuff in the fine print. And in fairness, I usually look at non-gap because it's an, it's a, it's an indicator of more operating performance, but, but look at the num the note four, the gap EPS, they lost $3 and 88 cents a share on a, on a $16 billion write down for equipment that is like, no longer any good. So they're just writing it off. Poof. Just taking it off the balance sheet. <laughs> Throw by by virtue of, of 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 or by taking off the income st statement by virtue of playing a balance sheet game and all these restructuring charges. And then this is why it's foundry. And you know, Pat talked about new foundry wins and 18A technology going really well. But this chart, you know, kind of says it all. It's like the and this is what Floyer and I wrote. The bigger they get, the more money they're going to lose because the gap between them and TSM keeps widening and widening. And without unlimited capital, they're going to have to keep bombing prices to actually take those design wins and scale them. So thanks, guys. This is, you know, I, I just, let me just add, the, the x86 business is in decline. Okay, AMD had good earnings, but the stock was down. Why? Because, you know, basically they're participating in a declining market and they're winning because they're gaining share against Intel. And so even though they beat and now they're, they, they beat Intel, now they got to go after NVIDIA and they're not going to take NVIDIA out the way they took Intel, you know, you know, off the top notch, off the top dog. And so, so people were a little bit down on, on AMD, but the point is that Intel's core market is in decline. It's it's one of its major competitors. AMD is winning share in x86 and executing better. And so, okay, the stock popped because they're actually 
guiding better than they thought. So you just do the math and it's better EPS. Yeah, so but what's the bottom uh, line? On Intel? Bottom line is it, it, Intel is in a place now where companies are, are talking about buying them because they're, you know, they've, they've had so much enterprise value taken out and they're reeling right now and the vultures are circling. And the bottom line to me is they, they can't continue to fund foundry and they, they've got to do something more than just trying to buy more time. And it's this kind of the same old story. I, I just not loving it. Yeah. I would not be all in on in, Intel fundamentally these days. Yeah. Intel, Intel struggle. Love the company. Lo I, I, I guess, I guess the other, to me, the bottom line is I feel like the design business is just being held back by foundry that if, if they would figure that out and figure out a way to get out of that foundry albatross, the design business would do great. I think Intel has such great designers and awesome people and amazing ecosystem, customer relationships. But this the foundry cost is just sixteen billion dollar write down. I mean, yeah. that's like sixteen billion. You know, it's a, it's incredible, and you know, Intel. Um, it's just, you know, partnering with AMD, AMD's there, NVIDIA's obviously the darling um, news today hitting um, from the information core. We've told investors it's signed contracts are worth 17 billion, including 10 billion from Microsoft from 2023 to 2030 and expects, expects revenue to grow 4X to 8 billion um, in 2025. So that's NVIDIA. The room, um, I interviewed a company called TensorWave which is got a, we reported on Silicon Angle, got a forty-seven million dollar uh, initial pop, and they haven't been priced their round yet. Uh, for they haven't been priced any stock yet. They're doing their first round, Series A, basically. They're AMD's horse in the race, so don't count AMD out, Dave, because they got to balance the whole x86 business with the future of uh, GPUs. So Nvidia's got to play there. So you're starting to see. The horses get clear on who's riding what horse. I, I don't I don't count AMD out only because Lisa Sue is such a I mean, she's done such a great job. I, I just I mean, I don't think they're gonna take out NVIDIA by by any means. I think they're gonna compete and they're gonna do oh, very well. They got a nice business. But again, I come back to this idea of we're just gonna trash the income statement and wipe it off the books and focus everybody on non-gap performance. And we're gonna play games with the balance sheet. And voila, all's well, good. And, and I think Intel, they're the old Wintel, you know, franchise, right? So a whole nother generation is coming. I bring up CoreWeave only because it's not so much that a competitor could beat CoreWeave. It's about the market opportunity, right? So if uh, NVIDIA gets in that game, they're going to take share. So, you know, who are, you know, that round will go out and the competitors round, you've got a comparable in market. <laughs> that's that's already at sixteen billion dollar valuation. So, you know, it's a ten bagger out of the gate. Many so, many many years ago, you and I had some sort of inside glimpse at at how Intel thinks and its strategy of wanting to have a level playing field. It's like the NFL. the 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 NFL want the owners right. They want balance, right? They want um you know, comp com you know, competition, they, they want to sort of balance because that's how they make the most money. And so the league wants that balance. And so, uh, that parity, if you will. And so does Intel when, when it was the dominant player, it wanted, it didn't want a single, it didn't want Michael Dell to dominate the PC industry. It wanted to dominate the PC industry. So it was happy to have, you know, Intel and the Lenovo and HP battling it out. And, and and it it was it was happy to supply multiple cloud players. It wanted a, a a more even, you know. It was it was happy when Microsoft took off and with Azure and was able to compete more effectively with AWS because it wants a, a level playing field. Nvidia now is in the catbird seat and they want the same thing. They they they're loving the fact that there are core weaves out, you know, raising money and that AWS and Google and Microsoft. And uh, you know, and 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 Broadcom such a great partner that there's there's all kinds of people buying <laughs> Nvidia GPUs and systems and 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 data center, you know, and and AI factories, if you will. So 
they want to be the mainspring of that innovation and have a level playing field. And so that's the hallmark of what I would say is a monopoly. The monopoly wants to have, they want to be the one, you know, or an oligopoly, but in this case, it's a monopoly. We are the one. Everybody take our stuff, HPE, Dell, Supermicro, Lenovo, Cloud Guys, get alternative GPUs. Yes, we'll just try to balance the supply and we'll keep making them as fast as we can. That's oh, the dynamic right well, now. Well, we're going to see a lot of action at supercomputing in Atlanta in a couple of weeks. And you know, you're know, going to see that show turn into an AI show, and that's going to be mm -hmm. a tell sign. So if you look at the shows coming up, what I'm looking really hard at is um, supercomputing, reInvent, CES, um, and then um, how these other shows build their apps on top of the infrastructure game. Because I think right now, as we've been saying, the infrastructure game is hot, mainly because that's that's where the fixes need to go now. Uh, KubeCon is next week or two weeks. Um, the Cloud Native Foundation, uh, Compute Foundation, OCP was hot. So you're seeing the CapEx and all these players just continuing to invest money because whoever can swim the fastest out to the boat owns it. And that's the game. I mean, the CapEx chart speaks volumes. Amazon clearly saying, we will not stand still in this AI game. Ruba Borna has reorganized the startup group. They're going to get behind startups. I got an exclusive coming up with Matt Garman, uh, the CEO of AWS. I'm going to fly out to Seattle for a one-on-one -on -one for a reInvent preview, our annual trek out to Seattle. Um, hopefully get to see Andy Jassy as well. Um, can try to convince him to come to NYSE when he's in town, but because uh, he's a huge Rangers fan. He's actually not a Mets fan. I mean, he's not a Yankees fan, by the way. They got killed uh, by the Dodgers. Um, he's a Mets fan. Uh, I don't know if you saw the World Series day, but I, I, I saw that. I did. I, I was. I was watching the game-winning run. How about I was that? watching the Celtics, and they they went way they went down big against Indiana. So I turned it to the game, and I saw the inning, the meltdown. I think it was the fifth inning when Judge dropped the ball, and I mean they just so many mental errors. And I, they they gave up like five or six unearned runs in the inning. Yeah. It was a disaster. It was like a, a meltdown of epic proportions. I never thought I, I would see the Yankees choke i mean that's the word choke so badly I they just red sox fans were kind of smiling a bit i know because yeah. you know they were down 3-0 remember the red sox were down 3-0 in 2004 and they won their first world series since babe ruth put the curse on them and uh you know i was thinking <laughs> this is reverse curse the reverse curse <laughs> it's, it's in the uh but what was great is mookie betts former red sox uh nation player he got the game winner and the coach is Dave Roberts, the greatest steal in the history of baseball. Yeah. So I couldn't resist. I had to get that in there. Um, and I, I was thinking about you last night because I know you had that big Halloween party and um, I missed my picks, Dave. My pick. Oh, oh did you have a player last night? No, I had in my pick'em pool. I, you know, remember last podcast, you reminded me to get my pick in, picks in. And so I was on I, East Coast time, but I get home and I'm like, oh, the game's on. It's 5 30. I'm like shit, it's locked. So I lost. I spotted the field points. Uh, oh, oh, you have a different pool. You have to I mean, pick every game, right? It's a pick 'em league, and you get points per game. And Thursday night's the big point game, and so I just spotted the field sixteen points. Oh, <laughs> it's oh, like, I'm like, I'm oh the top that hurts. 20 that the hurts. League. Right now, I'm climbing fast. I had, I'm se I'm seven and one in our in our pool, uh, and I'm 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 at the top of the heap, which you know everybody's going to try to take me down. But, uh, I had, I had, the, I'm not even know what my standing is. Can you check my standing? Because I don't even know what I'm, I basically never picked. I think the computer picked for me and whatever I got going on is all luck. Cause I never was logged in once. That can work both ways. Sometimes the computer's good. Other times the computer gives you crap. Yeah, I need an AI agent uh, for that. That's what we're AI agent. <laughs> I need an AI agent. Come on. Give me my, picture. what else is happening? The interest rates. You mentioned that. Um, when we were talking, that's yeah, no. an interesting dynamic. What do you make of that? Well, that's, I think the economy, okay. I think the productivity gains are going to come even faster. I think this is the beginning of, of a um, good economy. Now, the only problem is, is that as we talk about the CapEx, there might be a bubble that doesn't burst, but I think, think of it like a balloon instead of the big pop. I think it's going to be a slow air coming out of it. And that's just to flush the bad deals out. But this bubble will not burst in my prediction because AI is too good right now. I mean, right now, even the first wave of AI is not good. 
I mean, it's good and it's going to pr produce low hanging fruit gains. That's going to provide productivity out of the gate. So I think the wins with AI will be immediate and the bigger gains are going to come on once people realize that they have the data. And, and here's the thing, Dave, the enterprise AI market is really, really off the charts. I did an interview two days ago with someone who's doing, looking at allotments, a company looks at how, the, how these companies, you know, I learned something new, new allocations when a product is built, that's an inventory problem, but allotments is a chip word, right? Where the chips are going to go. So you Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Broadcom, these guys all have to think about who gets what supply of their chips or right. allotments. And th that economics is a financial game because it's not just price. It's about relationships, deals they've done. And so this idea that the enterprise will create more value faster um, than the consumer is about to happen. I think, I think this is going to be a real discussion that the enterprise game for enterprise AI will be even more compelling than the internet to intranet innovation in a couple cycles ago. So, you know, we're watching very closely. We mentioned we did a deep dive a couple of times earlier on in, uh, IBM's opportunity with Watson X, but I think you're going to start to see the hyperscales line up to create these connected ecosystems and the customers will be enterprise. Okay. Enterprise edge, enterprise on premise, enterprise in the cloud, it's all cloud operations. So I think you're going to see mobile world Congress and CES be about devices and edge connectivity. And again, we're already preparing for mobile world Congress, the research team. So we're tracking the network aspect of innovation around AI, and that's all going to fuel a massive rising tide of value creation in the enterprise. Okay. No I doubt. love this. I love this conversation. So, I mean, I'm not really a bond guy, but as everybody knows, the Fed sets the short-term interest rates, but the markets, the bond markets set the, the long-term rates, like the 10 year and the 10 year has been going up despite the fact that supposedly the Fed's going to be cutting rates. So a couple things are happening there, I think, is one is people think, well, maybe the Feds aren't going to be cutting rates because the economy is stronger than people thought. The other is there's so much U.S. debt that there's concerns about, you know, long-term concerns about the U.S. losing its reserve currency. And so the long-term rates are going up. I think you said, what, from 3.8 to now, where I don't know where they are now. They're four, like three. below the 4.3. But that's a big, big move. So that basically... You know, people call them the bond vigilantes that are going after um, the fact that the U.S. has so much debt. Okay, why is that relevant? Uh, guys, bring up this this chart. So this is a tweet from Eric Brynjolfsson, uh, who's an economist. He was an MIT economist. He's now at Stanford. And he's basically saying, hey, productivity is happening. And it's it's outperforming. This blue line is sort of the productivity boost that we're seeing. Now, the red line in February 09 and 010 above, above the norm is because uh, we were coming out of a real downturn, right? That was the financial crisis. So it really wasn't sort of organic. But the blue line here coming out of, um, you know, the, the pandemic is potentially some kind of, you know, post-pandemic tailwind, but he's trying to normalize that. And that blue line, he's showing that Productivity is outperforming what we thought it would be pre-pandemic. And to your point, John, this week's breaking analysis introduces a new term. Not enterprise AI, but enterprise AGI, where everybody thinks, you know, everybody talks about uh, artificial general intelligence. We're defining AGI as where, where machines can do jobs that white collar workers can do and do it better. That's what we're calling enterprise AGI. And the topic of this week's breaking analysis is how Jamie Dimon is actually Sam Altman's biggest competitor. Why? Because the LLMs that OpenAI and others, the foundation models that they're building that are so expensive that the prices are dropping like crazy, they're trained on public data, internet data, and they've got some, you know, deals with guys like Reddit and, and Twitter. Well, Twitter's training its own data, but they don't have access to Jamie Dimon's data. And what Alex Wang, who's a scale AI, uh, shared with us is that GPT-4 was trained on half a petabyte of data. 
Jamie Dimon's sitting on 1.5 petabytes of data. Now, bigger's not always better, but he is going to be able to take swarms of agents and train them and specialize them on his own proprietary data. And Sam Altman, thanks guys, is never going to get access to that data. So the point is that there's a productivity boom coming and we're starting to see it in Brynjolfsson's numbers already, but it could represent a decade long productivity increase that we haven't seen John since the PC era. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. We've been saying this all along. So I think he's, you're right on this. I like this new term. Oh yeah. Enterprise AGI. Now I've been doing some research around, you know, how to prevent AGI from happening by scaling intellect over AGI. So, you know, when you, when you talk about the human in the loop, whether it's enterprise productivity and individual contribution for human in the loop, there's also um, human in the loop for things like impact investing, sustainability. So what's happening is, is that there's going to be a counter force to AGI. Think of AGI as, maybe this is a bad example, but I'll, I'll try anyway. Think of it like AGI as Darth Vader, right? And the force is human AGI. So, you know, so if... <laughs> I mean, everyone's afraid of AI right now, even the regulations, even the executive order out of the White House. I mean, they're putting putting out executive orders around requirements of stuff that's going to be obsolete. You showed the chart earlier around, um, you know, the, the scale down of um, the price per a model. So, you know, they're already putting- Yeah, show that, show that, guys. Show the, bring that back up. back up. This is the slide. This is the price drop like a rock. Now, forget the price for a minute. This is an innovation slide. So what the, what's happening in this is I had a long chat with my my kids about this because they're now adult young adults and you know we're always riffing around you know what government should do and not do its election year all that good stuff. But Thanks, what this guys. slide shows is this is an innovation slide and you brought up PC era during the early days of the PC revolution. Okay, it was very much a Moore's law and Windows OS and then obviously the applications and Office Suite, but it really was about Windows and the relationship with Intel. This is showing the relationship between these models, which as a proxy connect to NVIDIA, Broadcom, Qualcomm, uh, all the chip guys, AMD, and even Intel. But I don't think Intel's even positioned to even take advantage of that at this point. So this slide means that things are getting faster, smaller, cheaper, which means they're changing. So that's what's going to happen next is these models are going to start talking to each other. So when you start to see documents and executive orders and PC, I mean, um, AGI-like thinking, it's going to kill a Skynet. That's a wrong approach because the innovation is just getting started. So this is going to continue to happen. This is going to swap out revs. So if you look at the chart and squint through the chart, it's uh, GPT 3.5. Yeah, show that. Show, bring it up again, guys. Yeah. So look at the look at the blue line and the white line. You got you know um, Claude, which is anthropic. You got Llama, which is Meta, Facebook, and you got GPT, which is open AI. And these models are all kind of like this proprietary or open. You get that for a minute. These are going to change. So when you but look say, at the, look at this cost per, per, per million tokens, 60 bucks yeah. down to 25 cents. Yes. Right. This and the, but gonna, the costs are going through the roof to build it's going these to things. fuel massive entrepreneurship. Okay. So what's happening in these markets where the tides are shifting so fast, there's no way in hell the government can even do the work. Thanks, guys. Even, even with open standards like NIST and others, but never mind the government's putting restrictions on things like, well, weights and biases have to, you know, they're getting in the weeds. That's like that's like trying to change the rules for the World Series when it's already over. Okay. The game's over. Now, and so the goalposts are moving so fast on the innovation side that the government can't keep up. Now, to, to AGI, AGI called Darth Vader because it's an evil source, if not managed properly. AGI becomes the outproduct of, of good AI. So that's way down the road. I think you asked me one time on the podcast, where I thought AGI was going to happen. I said, no, not, not for at least 10 years. You said, ah, maybe five. I forget what, what we debated, but the issue on AGI is that that's machines. The human in the loop is so powerful with productivity that there's now discussions in the industry from the think tanks and folks like us in research that say the scale of productivity, which is intellect, will, will map to this as well. So the cost to do something in work 
is going to go down, but the productivity goes up. Um, there was a post, I think Mark Andreessen wrote it, or I forget someone wrote it around the 10 X engineer about a decade ago. And that was a, to talk about the labor increase for moving into the cloud. If you were a technical person, you can move to the cloud and get 10 X value, which means hire 10 engineers in the old model and you get one in the cloud. We're going to a hundred X now on the, on the technical talent. And on the business side, you are starting to see a 10 X like business person. So the AGI and the enterprise to your, to your breaking analysis, that's going to ship tomorrow is so important because that's where the metrics are going to come in. The business performance, um, how the applications are working in this new connected ecosystem. And then ultimately at the end of the day, the intellect uh, application of intellect, scaling so, ideas, scaling productivity, teamwork, all that stuff, all going to change radically. And that is undocumented and it's not even input into regulation. So and I think, you know, we use this term AGI and there's a lot of different, there's, there's AGI and there's super intelligence. Like, like Ray Kurzweil uses the term, I think he talks about AGI, but he, I would call it super intelligence where uh, you basically uh, if you get hit by a car tomorrow and you die, your consciousness can be hot swapped and preserved because it's stored somewhere and, 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 and super intelligence will allow you to biologically recreate, you know, your body and then you're, you know, you're human or not. I don't know. That's like S Star Trek, you know, kind of science fiction. But we're sort of narrowing the definition here of AGI as to, you know, Elon says within five years, um, machine intelligence will surpass biological intelligence, all, you know, collective biological intelligence. Uh, but here's the rub. Here's the nuance. Everybody talks about the data wall, that these foundation models are going to hit a data wall. And what they'll be able to do and will do is they'll create synthetic data to close that gap. But the problem is they are not going to get access to Jamie Dimon's data unless he sells it to him or gives it to him. Maybe they will. Maybe there's a business model there. But that's the real data wall yeah. is access to that tribal knowledge. And the other thing, John, is processes. Okay, so, so processes, if you think about automation, we've automated the back office. We've automated with, 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 with apps. We've automated HR, we've automated CRM because those, those apps are generic and they scale with custom applications. You know, we've gone further down the power law, but the big opportunity is all the internal pro think of all the internal processes at companies and the knowledge of, of how to handle exceptions and that none of that is, is automated in software in yeah. packaged software. Well, how's that going to get automated? The way it's going to get automated is that proprietary data that Jamie Dimon has access to is going to be able to train agents with exceptions that the agents are going to learn from those exceptions. And then they're going to get smarter and smarter and smarter. And the foundation models, they may contribute to that, but they're not, Jamie Dimon is not going to let, you know, his competitors take their processes and copy them. And so it's like George Gilbert says, Nick Carr's IT doesn't matter. You know, he was, you know, 20 years too early on that one. But basically what he's saying is what matters now is the ability to understand those reasoning traces from humans and then bring them into your agentic system. And that's something that nobody's talking about. And we've been researching and uh, I think we're, we're onto something here yeah. and that ultimately drives the productivity and it ties back to the long-term you know, bond rates, because hopefully that will help us grow and get out of this debt mess that we're in. Yeah, And I think your point about the process is huge because we just had Salonis' event in Munich, Germany. They're one of the hottest growing companies there. You start to see Amazon Web Services do this, others. The value in the applications are going to be very vertical focused. So if you look at all the um, big tech players that are positioning themselves with either CapEx or if they've yielded the CapEx gain like IBM has done to others, they're playing in a, in a realm that is around industries and verticals. So um, company industries are, are going to be big. So you got all these industries like oil and gas, media entertainment. Guess what? All of them are refreshing their apps with agentic systems, which are basically on a series of agents, which we've been covering the Cube Research. Check out thecuberesearch.com. Got a good plug in there for them. 
but this is real day because that's where the productivity comes in. But you can't get the productivity of that AI unless you have the horizontal scale of distributed computing architectures. That means that cloud and on-premise and edge all are working under one operating model and the data is flowing around. So you're gonna see Mobile World Congress and CES where devices are connected, whether it's on a human's wearable or phone or campus office, anywhere there's a device connected to the internet it has to be connected into this kind of brain. Every company will have a neural network brain and that's gonna be their data. So you know, every company is a Jamie Dimon. Now Jamie Dimon's got a ton of data because as you point out, he's gonna have enough data to train on, but where's he gonna get the GPU from? They'll build some on their own and they'll go to these services like Core Weave and AWS. But well, you're right. And so you're right though. You know, it's, a, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like an electrical grid. It's like grid computing. It's like they have to figure out that you got to get the resources to power this. So you know, if you remember back in the 90s and early 2000s, grid computing was a paradigm around data centers. Well, that guess what? We're living in a grid model, both social grid connected on apps digitally. You're seeing graph technologies, you're seeing um, all kinds of new architectures that frankly are well positioned for computer science and AI. I'm a big believer in this because if you don't get the formulas right on managing those vertical industries, it won't work. So that, well, that's and that's take. where that, you're right, that's where that proprietary knowledge comes in. And, and that's where you know, Jamie Dimon and JPMC, they're a metaphor for tens of thousands of companies who have proprietary data and are leveraging it in unique ways. I mean, in a very small scale, we, we've been on this for, well, how long now? When did we start the Cube AI? I mean, this, the foundation was set, you know, before ChatGPT, but yeah. post ChatGPT, it's, you know, like many companies, we realized right away that that's our competitive advantage. Well, it's great. It's great to see the world spin where we thought it was going to go. We've been, I think, remember 2015, we started talking about horizontal scale vertical specialization. That was before the lingo changed to, you know, Gen AI apps. But, you know, the full stack is, is changing. You got, you know, the bottom at the infrastructure layer. You got the the middleware, which is essentially all this glue layer. And then you got the applications. And, and you know, these, the word glue layer has always been a term in the industry. And the glue right now is also brings things together, but also lubricates the distribution of data, which means speeds the AI, right? So... You're seeing a whole nother category of computing coming, David. It's super exciting. You know, the events I'm looking forward to coming up is uh, KubeCon. That's going to give us a state of the union for um, cloud native developers. Your, your, slot, your slide about the price performance increases in models is going to turbocharge the intellect of the developer community, especially in open source. Open ecosystems will be the winning formula. KubeCon will be a, a proxy for that. Supercomputing, that's going to give us a, a lens into what's going on in the convergence of uh, AI, Gen AI, supercomputing for the masses, because that's what NVIDIA and Broadcom are basically doing. They're democratizing through their chip innovation. Not only chips, networking, connectivity, Wi-Fi, 5G. And then finally, CES and MWC, we start to see the applications in AWS reInvent. You're going to start to see where these first-gen uh, use cases are the I call the beachhead. So in every new wave, you got beachhead, and in every new wave, you got scale. So capture the beachhead, pick up adjacencies, broader market opportunities that scale on adjacencies, and then you go deep. Uh, and that's that's the progression. So we're, we're seeing it now. And so finally, we're starting to see the the fruit coming on the tree from you know two years of AI discussion. So it's super super valuable. And then and we're at Dell day, next week. A bunch of us are at Dell next week too in Austin for their, um, the Dell tech summit, which is their annual analyst meeting. I don't know if you saw their stock was up like, I don't know, 5% today. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's up on that super micro news where super micro ran into all these, you know, their auditor quit and all kinds of stuff came out. And so that I think has, has been, they've been up on sympathy. Dell has. Yeah. So I'm excited to see Michael Dell and all the 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 team down in Austin. I got to get my cowboy boots out. <laughs> I was wearing when I go to Texas. Week. I'm doing. I'm going to be in Boston. I'll see you in Boston on Monday and Tuesday. And I'm going to fly to New York for a media day, 
We're doing a media day on November 7th. The NYSC will be broadcasting all day from our location there. And uh, just more content flow. And you're going to start to see a lot awesome. more Cube video content coming out of our, our team, our Cube research Where are you team. election day? Where are you election day? You're here in New York. I'm in uh, Boston. Yeah. Got my you're going to vote? I, I did the mail on. Any predictions? <laughs> well, it depends. If you watch Fox News, Trump's going to win by a landslide. If you watch CNN and MSNBC, it's a nail biter. So, you know, if you if you just use that and you're Hollywood and you're um, New York and these elite areas, you probably think Kamala's going to win. But if you take Fox News and CNN or MSNBC and say, if that's the if you take their statements and you go right in the middle, it's a Trump win because. If you look at the gambling side, they're predicting Trump, although there was a lot of um, hacking going on to maybe stuff the ballot there. Um, again, it, apparently, I mean, I'm not tracking the thing, but it, it's, it seems to be close. Um, but again, Fox News is predicting Trump win by a lot, a landslide. And then over here, it's a nail biter. And then in between, if you, if you take the middle, I think it's Trump wins. And so. I th uh, interesting. I, I, so. Sack said he he wasn't going to fly to Mar-a-Lago unless he was convinced Trump was going to win. Now, I suppose he's going to Mar-a-Lago. I'll take the other side of that. I think I think Kamala is going to going to surprise. It's remember the red what was it the red the red, red wave? wave. Red yeah, wave. I think they're going to be another surprise. I think women are going to come out and vote in yeah. in, in I mean, in I'm a not big a, way. I'm not a pundit on politics. Like I said, I just use my. I'm flipping a coin. I mean, so I'll just take the other side for. I kicks. just took the unscientific survey of my kind of vibe. Now, the wild card for me on this is that, and I predicted this last election, the Democratic machine that's on Kamala's side are highly motivated, and what they do really well, even though the Trump claims he's got a ground game with his rallies. All he's doing is rallies and photo ops. But if you look at the Democrats, they got a ground game machine. And that's where I think the Republicans were saying that they cheated because where, where did these, where, how did they win? There's a silent, there's silent troops out there on both sides pushing. But I think the Democrats win on ground game. So the wild card for Kamala in these swing states will be um, the ground game. Now, CNN was actually reporting yesterday that the registrations for Republicans in the swing states was off the charts. Not sure if that's from Elon Musk's involvement. He offered a million dollar a day bounty. By the way, he's getting sued by one of the blue states by saying that's a lottery. Um, so that that was funny. Um, but you got a lot of active things. And and again, this is this election cycle is about to me about the podcasters, right? So again, I started podcast 20 years ago before it was it was big. And um, it didn't work on that way because it was just too early. Um, although we had great, great success at that time, it's just not venture backable. But this year, you got Joe Rogan, you got these podcasters, they pull numbers, okay, big numbers. And you got X basically all in for Trump because Elon's transparent about it. I'm all in for Trump. And so information, whether it's misinformation, it doesn't matter if it influences those votes. It could swing it. So there's so there's the digital ground game, and then there's the physical ground game, Dave. So we'll it's the so up. so so remember, so 2012 was like I think really the first time we saw the effective use of social media. Uh, the remember we used to interview guys from the Obama campaign on the Cube, and they talked about how they use data and and social, and then and and so that was kind of the big data era, and then and social era. Then 2016, it was like the big talk was weaponization and um, and 2020 was all about fake news. And I wonder if we look back in 2024, is, is one side going to be more effectively using AI or is AI in, in the state of AI today, just too nascent, like dial up where it's not as effective, or maybe it's hallucinating, giving them the wrong data. So it'd be interesting to see the post-mortem on what role AI plays. Or it could be inbred, in as Andy Kessler said on the Wall Street Journal. It could Journal. be inbred. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's just funny. I got to say that. Was that was Kessler. Was great. Um, great article. I, I, on my opinion on that is that it's too early. I think it's it's too embryonic. It's not going to happen. AI will probably infect the next election. Um, in fact, I should, I should say. Impact. In fact, I should say. Um, I think Did you say infect? A, I said infect. <laughs> it will. I mean, it's going to be infused. Um in fact, infused, impacted. 
I don't think it's going to impact. If anything, maybe some helping people write stuff and do instant messages and do stuff there. But I don't think it's going to be material. I think next next cycle it will. This year it's about alternative media. That's the story. The substacks of the world, the podcasts. Um, that's the action. I think that's going to. We'll see. I mean, who knows? Dave, all right. Well, we um, all know. We'll know by the next podcast. So wait, you which, you'll be in NYC or in Boston on Tuesday? I'm going to be in Boston. Okay, good. So we'll 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 watch the election together. Although yeah, I am flying out, I think that night. So yeah, all right, so man. we'll we'll know next podcast. We'll talk about who's going to win. So we'll see. We'll wake up and I'll either going to be in New York the day after the election. It's going to be. Uh, uh, I remember where I was when Trump won uh, his first term. It was like it was a watch party to celebrate for Hillary Clinton, and it was like totally dead. Obviously, Democratic leaning. That's what I'm wondering. Sachs is going down to Mar-a-Lago. That could be. Uh... Yeah, what that could know? be a, 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 a an interesting scene. Who knows? That could, be, that could be a lonely flight back to California. Well, I just hope that the whole thing doesn't get locked up in the courts like it did in um, in two thousand, because that screwed up the everything. Everybody was so focused yeah. on that; it crushed the stock market. I don't know. Actually, maybe that's a good thing. It could present buying opportunities. I think people should accept the election good. results, and if there's if there's some th suspicion. I mean, just got to go to a voter ID. Come on, let's just get over with. I mean, there's no argument for that. Just should get it be, done. Should be pretty I mean, straightforward, shouldn't it? All right, Dave, we'll salute you another time. We'll see you on the right, other John. side of the election. And Thanks, we'll guys. On the next pod, it'll be President-elect Trump or President-elect Harris. So we'll see. All right. <laughs> All right, see you next time.